say good morning and thank you so much to each of you who serve as citizens on this board making substantive rules. It's a very unusual uh, precedent. And in 30 years of public service, myself as a high level official often, I've testified, written testimony, analyzed written legislation. And I said to my um, helper who managed to get me here today, because health is an issue for me, this is the first time in the 68 years that I've ever testified as a citizen on an issue like this. And I'm honored that it's before a citizen's board. What I said to the uh, members of the board when I asked that they take the packet is at the back of the packet there's a chart I'll be referring to that's the actual risk assessment data on Ball Mountain from the Belieden study that was done in 1990. That mountain is relevant not just because J.D. Irving owns the mountain or owns the land, but because the uh, risks that we're lucky enough to have measured for us. Most states are not usually in this situation where they actually have this huge, rich volume of data in a state that hasn't had any actual mining. So the data that we're lucky enough to have on Bald Mountain tells us a lot, and I'm sure my, uh, the associate here from Santec will um, attest that this is also very indicative of what we're likely to find at other main deposits, um, Mount Chase and um, Alder Pond, because they're in the same geologic deposit. We know that one end of that deposit, Elizabeth Mine in Vermont, a super fun site that um, Dr. Seal, Dr. Robert Seal, has just done a, a big piece of work on, has a similar geochemical profile to Bald Mountain, similarly very, very high risk. And we also know that a mountain at the other end of that geologic um, structure, um, the Brunswick 12 at Bathurst, which is a perpetual care mine, also has anomalously high risk. The kind of deposits that we have in Maine are called volcanogenic massive sulfides. And as a type of deposit, they're at the second highest risk category. So that's very different from the kind of mines they have in New Mexico, very different from the kind of mines they have in other parts of the world. Um, so that's a special risk category. And what this data on Ball Mountain tells us is that even in that second highest risk category, our mountain is off the charts anomalous. And that's the chart at the back that you don't need to refer to it now, but I'll, I'll give you a context for understanding that chart. Um, I am here today, I should explain who I am. Bowker Associates is a, a nonprofit in formation. We engage issues of um, potential massive economic consequence in the state of Maine with a view to informing all parties to bringing in-depth information that's normally not available to a legislator, member of a board, an environmental committee, a commissioner, um, because it takes a, just a huge amount of time to get that deeply into any one issue. So we only deal with one or two issues at a time so that we can really get deeply inside it. And the idea is to share that information with all parties um, to an issue, and that's, that's what we do. Um, so um, the issues that we've engaged to date, just to give you an example, are the Searsport tank brought by DCP for the 22 million gallon um, LPG tank, um, Chenbro's east-west highway, J.D. Irving's rolling pipeline of Bakken through Maine, and the um, issues, are we ready for um, phase three of Callahan um, Superfund? Are we well informed? Are we looking in the right direction? And this issue, this revisitation of mining law and regulation, um, although prompted by um, J.D. Irving's um, interest in mining, is not about J.D. Irving's interest in mining. It's about the fact that our regulations, our statute, has to aim at a much higher benchmark than other states. The challenges that we have in Maine 
just in the nature of our geology, as indicated by Bald Mountain. And um, I'm sure if you ask Robert Seal, who's done most of the work at Bald Mountain and, and most of the ARD work at the, at the uh, Elizabeth Mine in Vermont, will agree with me, and I'm sure the uh, consultant from uh, Santac will agree, that it's very likely that we'll see these same um, irregular, super high risks at our other sites. Although, of course, it varies within a site and within a deposit. Um, I had come here initially wanting to, to beg you to please not let this hearing become a revisitation of the, of the polarities. And I have to say, I've agreed with pretty much everything that both sides have said today. Um, a lot of very constructive information has come forward. Um, there's obviously a consensus that anti-mining is not a wise policy and that rhetoric and hype and um, uh, uninflated, unsupported promises are, are not something we need to do here today. The truth is we left the gate in the wrong direction and we're almost at the finish line and along the way no course correction has happened. So what I wanted to do today is give you sort of some touchstones for how to look at this information and how to um, uh, understand really what our status quo is, both with respect to the statute and with respect to this law, as a package of um, is, this, is this a response that can really drive to the right decisions and make the, the, the most sensible decisions for the extremely high level of risk we have in Maine. Um, as a risk manager uh, looking at mining for the first time two years ago, I've done a lot of work and I was risk manager for New York City DEP, which is one of the largest public utilities in the country and did a lot of work in um, on the third water tunnel, that was my major risk management project. And I thought I had seen it all, done it all, been to the outer edges of what risk management can even begin to try to pull under some kind of control. But I have to say, I've developed an incredibly healthy respect for metallic mining and sulfide ores. Compared to all other areas that have a risk or a public impact, that um, affect the public interest and bring them under law and regulation. As a risk manager, I tell you that mining, metallic mining in sulfide ores involves much more uncertainty than is usually present in any other kind of business decision or any other kind of regulatory decision. It involves more severe consequences from errors and unexpected failures than almost any other endeavor that we might undertake as a society for any reason. It involves the least opportunity for recovery from failure. Several other um, uh, speakers this morning have uh, spoken to that very eloquently. Um, and it's absolutely true. A mistake in mining, if you let the acid start and you let the uh, toxic metals leaching begin, it's almost impossible to mitigate, control, correct, or undo. It's almost an irreversible error. So the whole structure has to drive towards understanding that risk from the very, very beginning and understanding where you can go in that mine, how you can go in that mine, what you have to do, and can you do it? Um, Mr. Fitzgerald uh, mentioned no-go zones. Uh, that's, a, that's a very important concept because what Boleden concluded in 1990, and Boleden was the world's leading expert in um, mining in volcanic massive sulfides. They also were very accustomed to doing that under incredibly strict Swedish regulations. They were like the perfect, the perfect company for Bald Mountain. They hired the very best um, environmental consultant then and now, SRK. So all the data that we have on Bald Mountain came from the very highest possible. I mean, you couldn't ask for, for a, a higher benchmark of quality in terms of the 
um, trustworthiness of the observations and the opinions. I'm the one that acquired the data that everybody's been looking at, and it took me a very long time, I have to tell you, to finally get it out. And I happened to miss the report that NRCM um, um, pulled and cited in their recent report. I was focused on the scientific information, the geochemical data, the actual risk data, because that's my focus. And I think a lot of you know from my distribution list, I've been circulating and interpreting and analyzing that information for everybody since June. When I saw the document that Pete Didesheim and um, Nick Bennett pulled from that file, a document that I missed, I almost fell over because there was what I've been wanting all along and begging for all along. There was an opinion by SRK, still to this day, the top, 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 top environmental consultant in mining, saying that in 1990, Belieden's plan, which was an open pit top to bottom excavation, was outside the bounds of any known technology at that time, that it could not be accomplished without degradation outside the area, significant degradation, in plain English. Um, and the truth about mining technology is on the risk side, there hasn't really been that much new. Nothing can change the geology of a mountain. So to say that uh, data from 1990 about the risks at Bald Mountain is not relevant to this rulemaking or not relevant to our consideration is both unwise and untrue. It's very relevant. The geology of that mountain and most likely the geology of our other mountains is permanent. Neutralizing potential doesn't rain down from heaven like mana. Um, sulfurs that generate acid don't turn into oats. And arsenic doesn't just transmute magically into something else. Those are inherent risks in the deposit itself, and they're still there. The advances that have taken place in technology and mining have not really addressed the risk side at all. What they have addressed is ways to extract metals that make attacking a mountain like ours that has a comparatively low grade of ore more economically feasible. And perhaps in that equation somewhere there's more money to do the extra measures that you have to take to address the risk. But the job that we're trying to accomplish here with our statute and our regulations is about how do you pull those two things together? And I think we've heard a consensus here this morning from almost everybody that's spoken that said that's really what it's all about. It's not about anti-mining. It's not about prohibiting mining. It's about good government and it's about building a legal structure and a regulatory structure that pulls this together in a responsible way. Some of you may uh, know, I, I don't know whether uh, Ms. Bertocci circulated my letter, but I petitioned you all not to accept this rule. Um, I didn't think it was even close to being worthy uh, of our time and effort in commenting on it and bringing it before you. Um, I still believe that. I, I, I don't believe it. It's not a matter of belief. It's, it's, it's fact. It, it needs work. We're not anywhere near there. So I urge you, please, to seek outside guidance. Mining is so complex and, and, and so risky and involves so many really esoteric parameters to even consider that a board of citizens, even though I'm sure you each did your homework, I'm sure you've been anticipating this for 18 months, so I'm sure you've been hitting Google like everybody else and trying to learn as much as you can and understand as much as you can. Um, I've put in a thousand hours and I, and I was a, a risk management expert with a heavy construction background and I'm floored by its complexity. And there are people out there that can help you. And I ask you, I ask you, I beg you, before you make any decision on this rule at all, that you reach out and retain one of those experts who's highly respected by the mining industry and who's also willing to serve NGOs and government agencies. The first list is a very big list. <laughs> the second list is a very small list. 
because almost everybody makes all their money from from uh, serving the mining industry. And I've put in probably several hundred hours doing outreach into the industry to find out, you know, who would be willing to serve us? Who would be willing to help us, you know, with the risk management companies for, for mining companies be willing to work for the state of Maine or willing to enter a requirements contract with the state of Maine? Most wouldn't um, without some outreach. But there are two or three people that, that uh, really understand this issue from both sides. And David Chambers, who came before the entire legislative committee last year, in my opinion, is the only person that can help you. Um, he is uh, highly regarded by uh, the mining industry. Um, he's worked on, he's an expert in perpetual care, which is one of the recurring issues that keeps coming up here. And I want to just say one little word about perpetual care before the end of that. And he's, um, he's done, worked with land use. He's worked with the concept of go, no-go zones. In fact, he invented it, um, not uh, for uh, an American regulator, but for um, uh, zones like the Amazon and things like that. He wrote an international responsibility uh, of mining guideline that's universally highly regarded. Um, I'm not uh, suggesting you hire and you rewrite the statute and the regs. I'm asking you, begging you to please uh, enter uh, a contract with him to read our statute, read our regs, and also read our 1991 regs, which are every bit as much a disaster. Those aren't good regs. They don't protect anything. They, and, they, and they don't tell a mining applicant how to get from A to Z. Anybody that's going to invest the kind of money you have to invest in mining needs to know, how am I going to get from A to Z? What's, you know, what, what's the deal? We don't have that. Um, so I beg you to please uh, look to David if he's available, or I could give you some other uh, suggestions. a very short list. Houston Kempton is another. Uh, Robert Moran is another. But uh, I really think uh, David's your guy. I just want to say uh, one tiny thing on this perpetual care, this 30-year versus 7-year. That's not what it's all about. Perpetual care is one of the uh, five foundational policies of a modern mining policy. And what perpetual care aims at from the very beginning, which is the whole point of what I'm telling you, from the very beginning right up front, develops a mine plan a plan for management of all the materials that are going to come out of that mine plan such that at closure you have a documentally, a documentable, scientifically supported, reasonable anticipation of a self-sustaining natural habitat restored to its original functions and characteristics. That's, that's the aim of, of all the policy around perpetual care. So yeah, it may take seven years. I mean, I, I think it's the Green Creek Mine in um, Alaska. Um, it's, it's taken them seven years of water treatment to finally attain that level. But the point about that mine is it was built and designed from day one, from the earliest, earliest, earliest time to avoid problems. Those are the two key things, risk avoidance and loss prevention. Those, those are the hallmark things. At the back of my, um, I just want to, if you could just take a. Oh, I just have one, one more quick thing. I appreciate your testimony, but I, I right. panic on one Right. So the other pillars, the other pillars of the other five pillars that must be in this a policy that you can use as touchstone in addition to the uh, perpetual care issue are it has to have uh, an ARD uh, management plan that's required that guides every decision from the very earliest time. It's not a matter of waiting to see what kind of waste is piled up on your site. And, and then uh, dividing it up into classes and deciding what to do with it safely. It begins at exploration and advanced exploration, which, by the way, is just as risky. And that was acknowledged by Santec. I, I agree with everything uh, Santec said. But you, you still have to have the risk assessment, because those big holes in a mountain like Bald Mountain 
will, and I believe right now are, generating acid that the mountain would not have generated by itself. The other policy foundation that is not clearly in our statute and definitely not addressed or central to this rule is called neutral drainage. Neutral drainage means uh, nothing that leaves this site in any manner whatsoever, whether it's through surface runoff, through groundwater, uh, not just discharges. Um, it can, can leave the site in a state of contamination. That's the policy found framework for the MEN program in Canada, which was available as a reference when we wrote our 1991 rules. Our thing here isn't even close. The other two really critically important things are our criteria for the selection of applicants. One of the first things Dr. Price told me when he was so generous to uh, spend time with me when I first took up this issue, and he is without question the gold standard for regulation on, on mining. He said Maine should not be taking up any consideration of mining unless it's committed to creating a mining specific highly qualified, equally expert to the mining operator staff. I respect the 150 years of talent on uh, DEP's um, team, and I respect the work that they've done, but that work is not in mining. Geology is not mining. It's, 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 it's an entirely separate field, um, and we should follow uh, Dr. Dr. Price's uh, wise advice. And the other is the criteria of the applicant. The applicant working in a mine like Bald Mountain, or any mountain, whatever mountain it is that turns up for us, um, has to have relevant experience in that kind of deposit, in that same climate, and has to have a working knowledge and a working familiarity with the whole range of technology that can be reasonably applied in that climate, and have demonstrated that he can put those things together uh, with a, a mine that is going to meet those other criteria of uh, self-sustaining post-care and neutral drainage. Uh, if you keep those touchstones in mind, which are outlined more clearly than perhaps I've said them in my oral testimony, um, I think we'll end up at the right place, and most especially if you seek uh, David Chambers' help. I thank you very much, and I thank you all. Thank you, Before we break.